Peter, we're at the end of the Big Questions in Free Will project. Uh, retrospectively, how did it go? Uh, what have you achieved? Well, we've accomplished our goal, which was to try to understand what the ready, readiness potential is and what it isn't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the initial claim of Libet was that you have uh, this readiness potential that precedes the onset of a decision, a conscious decision to move one way or the other, mm -hmm. to move your finger um, by something like a second and a half. And people have taken that as evidence that the decision is made long before you're conscious of the decision being made. And we thought that, you know, a lot of this is kind of premature. We don't even know what the readiness, readiness potential really is. So let's try to dissect it and see what it is. So we did actually four or five experiments trying to uh, consider different cases. Um, we, we looked at a case where um, you have uh, to make a decision, but no motor act. And the question was, in, the, in that case, will you get a readiness potential? And the, and the answer was yes, you get a readiness potential even if the decision uh, is an internal one, to pay attention to this versus that. And then we did another experiment uh, that looked at whether you get a readiness potential if you're just cued. And if you have a flash that says, press the button now, you press the button, there's no readiness potential for that. Um, then we did another experiment that tried to ask whether uh, you get a readiness potential even in the absence of conscious willing. So, you know, it's kind of hard to remove conscious willing. Mm -hmm. What we came up with was hypnosis. You, you hypnotize someone to um, make a motor act uh, given a post-hypnotic suggestion. So they, you hypnotize them, they wake up, and then they have to... Um, do some motor act, move a finger or squeeze a ball at a time of their own unconscious choosing as opposed to con conscious choosing. And in that case, uh, we asked, do you get a readiness potential in that case? And we found, yes, you do. And so basically we find you can get a readiness potential without consciousness of uh, choosing or in intending to move. Uh, you can get um, a motor act without a readiness potential if it's triggered by the onset of some exogenous or external cue. Um, you can get a readiness potential even in the absence of a motor act. And then we also asked whether the onset of the readiness potential really had anything to do with the onset of the conscious willing. And so going back to John Stuart Mill, the claim is that if two events are causally linked, they have to have some temporal relationship. Mm -hmm. So then we said, okay, is the onset time of the readiness potential in any way linked to the onset time of this willing? And we basically redid an experiment by Haggard and Eimer um, and came to the conclusion that, no, there's no causal link between the onset of the readiness potential and the onset of willing to move. And it seems, therefore, in conclusion that the readiness potential is simply not uh, causal of willing to move, consciously willing to move, and could happen in the absence of consciousness, it seems to be, I think, largely irrelevant to the question of whether um, uh, consciousness is, you know, uh, ruled out as a causal influence by this um, readiness potential. The readiness potential seems to happen whether we're conscious or not. But it does mean something, because it does precede the the uh, not just the, the motor activity, but the urge to that I'm going to move. Right. So it seems to be, to me, to be an indicator of an ex expectation of some subsequent uh, action or event. There's a very closely, closely related potential pattern called the uh, contingent negative um, variation, which the CNV, which looks more or less similar, and it precedes uh, the occurrence of an expected event. So merely expecting something to happen leads to something very similar to a, a readiness potential. Mm. So, you know, the... Um, so the implication of this, I think you, you're saying, is that you've shown that what has been the focus of attention for, what, three decades now, uh, in terms of understanding free will or even consciousness itself, you're saying is may have been the wrong direction, because this may yeah. be quite uh, not as relevant people thought. Right, so we called our paper on uh, one of these experiments, b barking up the wrong free. <laughs> it's a pun, but I mean, I think yeah. that the field has been barking up the wrong tree and focusing on the readiness potential, because if the readiness potential happens without consciousness, whether conscious or willing or not, if it happens um, 
you know, if it can happen uh, without a motor act, and you can have a motor act without it, it seems to be, uh, yes, some sort of indicator of a subsequent act, whether motor torque or not, or an expectation of a subsequent act, but it's not very relevant to discuss discussions, I think, about the causal efficacy of consciousness in general. The question is not whether consciousness is necessary for subsequent acts. The question is, are there any cases where consciousness is sufficient for a subsequent act? And I don't think Libet's work addresses that. I don't think that our work addresses it either. I think it's largely unaddressed. I think there's a whole huge domain of work that needs to be done to try to find uh, a causal role for consciousness. It might not exist in the, these simple cases of proximal finger movements. When I say proximal, I mean, you know, an intention to move right now. Mm -hmm. um, it probably has something much more to do with deliberation of uh, possible courses of action in the more distant future. Should I partake in this experiment or not? What's in it for me? Should I marry this person or not? Should I marry that person or not? Should I choose this career or not? And if this kind of deliberation is really where the action is in free will, well, science hasn't addressed that. But the burden would be on you to show that those kinds of distal, complex uh, uh, kinds of contemplation in which you would say your strong version of free will is working is something more than the uh, sum of a very large series of, of small proximal decisions which, which these experiments utilize. You'd have to say there's something unique in, in, in uh, these complex, long-distance kinds of planning. Yeah, I think it's simply a different kind of operation. So what is, what is actually the role of consciousness in the Libet paradigm or these uh, related Wegener-like paradigms? Um, I believe that uh, what's going on is an assignment of selfhood or agency or authorship, saying, I did that, or that belongs to me. Um, and that is a very different kind of operation that what, than what goes on in deliberation. So let's first talk about proximal ac acts and proximal intentions. Um, there's a uh, beautiful and simple model that started with Helmholtz. He wrote, he wrote about it in the context of eye movements, but um, it's more generally applicable, which is to say there's the comparison between what was planned and what actually took place. And if those two things match, the system says, I did that. Mm -hmm. And if there's a mismatch, the system says, I didn't do that. Now, this, this model is called the corollary discharge model or the Efrid's copy model. Those are fancy words, but the basic idea is very simple. There is a, an assessment of whether something was done by the self, by this body. So for example, if I plan to reach for an apple and I compute a, a motor trajectory and I execute it, well, what I did and what I planned match, then I say, okay, I matched, I did, I did it. And let's say I plan to do this, but the wind blows me at the last second and my arm actually does this. Then I say, well, there's a mismatch. I didn't do that. So those kinds, that is an important role for consciousness. I think it's important for an animal to know what it did, uh, what was done by itself versus done by the environment or some other animal. It's important for an animal to say, this is my body and that's not my body. Um, but that's a retrospective judgment. That happens during the act or even after the act. That's very different, I think, uh, from the role of consciousness in deliberation, which is prospective. It's looking toward the future. And a, pros uh, a prospective consideration of options is something like this. Uh, you know, uh, I'm given the task, say, to choose uh, people for a dinner party tonight. I say, okay, what are, the, what are the constraints? What are the criteria? Well, I have a table that can sit, sit uh, you know, eight people, there's me and my uh, spouse, there's six places. Okay, I want half men, half women. Okay, well, what about these three and those three? Then you say, oh, no, but Sheila went out with Bob and they broke up, so Bob is out. And then what about Mike? And then, you know, you have this sort of constraint satisfaction and you're playing out options in a sort of virtual reality of your work memory or imagination or uh, mental imagery then when that constraint is met, then you pl play it out in a sort of iterative and open fashion. It's not, it doesn't necessarily come to a final conclusion 
quickly. Then you say, okay, well, let's consider what to, what to make for dinner. Oh, oh, Sheila's vegetarian. Okay, what are the options? Well, we can make falafel. No, but falafel is a kind of low-class food. Let's have a spinach lasagna. And then you run through it and you play it out in this virtual reality. And then you say, oh, spinach lasagna is good. Okay, now I need to get some spinach. And you go get your car keys and you go. So that role of consciousness is radically different from the role of consciousness in these uh, proximal cases where you're saying, I did that. It's, that is retrospective. Mm-hmm. The role of consciousness in this uh, mental imagery or imagination or deliberation domain is prospective, considering multiple possible options, weighing them based upon criteria that are perhaps innate, but also perhaps held in working memory, and coming to a conclusion. So what you're doing is you're uh, in the project experiment kind of dealing with the the proximal um, analysis of the readiness potential and sort of putting that into its package and saying, okay, now that we understand what that is and what it is, and now we need to, if we want to think about free will and consciousness, we have to go in a totally new direction. Yes. So, you know, there, there are people, a lot of people in my field uh, in neuroscience uh, who have been saying, well, see, Libet has shown that there is no free will. And I'm I just like, oh, wait, wait a second. You know? First of all, let's be very clear about what the readiness potential is and isn't. And then uh, if we can come to the conclusion, like I think we have, that it's largely not relevant to the question of free will, then we can start to look for free will where it exists. I mean, I think the field has been sort of like the, the person who looks for the keys where the light is good rather than where the keys are. <laughs> Why? Because it's easy to measure readiness potentials. Um, it's hard to study the neural basis of imagination, of deliberation, of mental imagery in the sort of open loop, open, open way that it actually operates in our lives. You know, I can do time locking to a meaningless and repetitive finger movement, which is, you know, it's, to say there's free will here is kind of pointless. There's, no, there's nothing at stake for me. In fact, I can just automatize it. But if it comes to a major decision like, you know, what country to live in, or who to, whom to marry, uh, what job to take. We can agonize over this for years even. This is where the action lies in free will, and this needs to be studied by science. It's just very hard. So what do some of your neuroscience uh, colleagues think of, of the research in terms of, do people really believe now that the readiness potential is not as related to free will as uh, they might have thought? Uh, well, we'll see how it plays out over the coming years. I, I mean, I think for ourselves, we are ready to put the readiness potential aside as being terribly informative about the issue of free will. But there's a lot left to do, and, you know, the, the big questions remain unanswered. What were your biggest successes, the feelings of, uh, of uh, achievement, and uh, correspondingly the frustrations? All right, well, science is just endless frustrations. I mean, for example, we had to run 22 subjects to a, you know, in the hypnosis experiment to get to a point where we could distill the four good subjects out because these subjects had to, at the end of the whole experiment, say, I have no memory of having been post hypnotically mm-hmm. or given a post hypnotic suggestion. And if they had any memory whatsoever, we couldn't even analyze their data. But you have to run them for four hours <laughs> before you get to the point. Where their data, where you can ask that question. So you know, it's frustrating. It's a hard business. Um, the project is kind of a, I think, a raving success in the sense that we were able to accomplish our goal, which was to put libid in perspective. I think we've been able to answer what uh, the readiness potential is to some extent, and what it isn't, what its causal role is, and its causal relationship to conscious willing. Um, so, you know, I think our group is ready to put that aside, and I hope the field will uh, agree that uh, it has been, in a sense, barking up the wrong tree in focusing on the readiness potential as an indicator of um, the inefficacy of conscious willing in general.